Oh, I guess we'll start it going. The sound's on, the stuff's around. I think it's all right. Lights are running. Let's start recording. Okay. Well, we're going to finish up Chapter 7. We're still at the Festival of Booths, and Festival of Booths is going to play. Uh, oh. I told you way back. What are, we're 70. We're number 70 for session. And I told you way back in session one, I think, about how the uh, John is described or outlined as the book of signs. It's also outlined as the book of festivals because both of those characterize the way that the book is set up, which is very interesting. That's why a lot of people say that it's the most Jewish gospel. But as we see, there's something else going on in John that, yeah, it's Jewish. It's got a really strong Jewish sense to it. But at the same time, the audience of John, the gospel, appears to be very Greek and very Roman. So as we're finishing this chapter, you know, here we've got, we've had this, this interaction with the throng, and I've got an outline. I've got part of the outline. I gave it to you on the thing. We'll finish the outline next week. But um, in 49, it's, this is a response of the Pharisees. This mob, this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. And let's see what that says in Greek. Well, here's the Greek. If you grab the Greek, here's the King James. But this people knoweth, knoweth not the law are cursed. All the other things, contrarywise, the throng, uh, it, the main are laced. It's a, that's um, a qualitative negation. They knowing the law, they not knowing the law, they imprecated, utter curse, they are. This is what it says, uh, standardized in the English. Contrarywise, the throng, they not, they not knowing the law, they are imprecated, literally, they utter a curse. By their speech, they utter a curse. Now, when we look at the outline, we'll see how that fits within it, but there's a setup and let's see, I don't think I have this set up for the, I call it jokes, but I changed it from jokes to telos because they are jokes. They're beautiful jokes in Greek or, or in the text. And here's one of them. Because remember, if you remember back up a little ways, is it in here? No. Nah. But if you look at, uh, I think, 47 or something, they ask the question, has any of the rulers, has any of the, the, any of the leaders Basically, of the Pharisees or Sadducees, priests, have any of them, we, first of all, the crowd asked the question, when did the rulers know that he was the Christ? That's an, a very interesting question. But that's what the throng asked. When did the leaders know that he was the Christ? And then later on it says, the, what leader has been convinced of Jesus? That's a setup. And the telos is here, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. You see this? It's a setup. It's a setup in the text. It's just like the setup that we got before. It said, well, Jesus is, how could Jesus come out of Nazareth or out of Galilee, right? But there is an unstated telos because they all know that all the audience of the readers, those who are hearing this, know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was recorded in the other Gospels. They knew the other Gospel accounts. So it's a but um bum right? This is a but um bum what leader, what leader has been convinced of Jesus? Now, it never tells us that Nicodemus was convinced of Jesus, does it? But there's an implication there. And watch what he says. Well, here's... Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus, and you notice the author reminds us, right? This is good uh, writing, but he reminds us that of chapter 3. Chapter 3 is all about Nicodemus. Nicodemus said unto them, he that came to buy Jesus by night, being one of them. Legea, he makes a logical argument. Nicodemus, forward to them, the he having come or gone, Forward to before formally 
one, he being from out of among them. So here's the translation. The, the Nicodemus makes a logical argument for it to them. He being the one who before having gone forward to him from among them. I know it's a little bit, you know, the Greek isn't convoluted. It's just the way that it expresses things. But it makes, all, you know, the translations, yeah, they're trying to make them clear to us. But this is really neat because you see how the author told us? He being the one who before having gone forward to him, that is Jesus, from among them. So you get this? The implication here is, was he officially, was he representing the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Yeah, the implication is that he is representing them officially. In other words, he drew the short straw. Before, you know, that we, we had this implication before back in chapter 3. Go back and review chapter 3. There's an implication that Nicodemus didn't come for himself. He came to answer the questions for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You get that implication again here. And it said, which of them is convinced of Jesus? Which of the leaders is convinced of Jesus? And then we get Nicodemus. Now, it doesn't answer our question. It doesn't, you know, the, the author and Nicodemus don't tell us, oh, Nicodemus was convinced of Jesus. It's an unstated tell us. It's really cool the way the author is doing this. Plus, it gives plausible deniability to Nicodemus. Right? It also, we don't know. We don't know where Nicodemus is at this point. He could be dead, probably dead, because, you know, late, it's a late gospel, 80, 90 AD, he may be dead. He could still be alive. He could have been what? He could have been a great uh, Christian witness to Jesus and to the people, right? We just, they didn't record that, but we don't know. I, I, I kind of would guess he was. He used to write it down, right? He, he's just forgotten in time because they didn't record it. But the implication you get is, yeah, he had some big thing, just like, uh, who's the other guy? Joseph Arimathea, right? You know, they were convinced. And when Jesus rose from the dead, you, you know, the implica what's the implication? What's the unstated tell us about all these guys? Were the disciples completely, we're going to see it in John. Were the disciples all in when Jesus was resurrected? Were they all in? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're running in fear. What did it take to get him going? Pentecost. Well, seeing Jesus at Pentecost and getting kind of the rally going, right? But what about the other guys? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, among others, right? They were all in. Joseph of Arimathea did what? Got him a tomb, yeah. got him sexed up, got, you know, did not recognize that Jesus was going to resurrect, right? But took care of everything. I'm taking care of it, bud. You know? What did Nicodemus do at the end? He helped. He was in on it with Joseph of Arimathea. Were they convinced? Seems like it to me. So what do you expect afterwards? The disciples are like, oh, these guys are all in. How about the woman at the well? We never hear about her again. When she heard about Jesus' resurrection, what do you think she was doing? She was going door to door. I'm just saying, you know, there are, there are great, there, there are unstated things that we can, you can, you can imagine the response of people, right? We never hear about it later. Why? Because it's not recorded. Why was it recorded? Because everybody knew it. Well, everybody knew it, but it also cost too much money to put it down on paper. But you're right. That's my point. Everybody knew it. So when they bring up Nicodemus here, let, let's just pretend that we're first century people here in this. We know the Gospels. We know this stuff. We're finally getting the rest of the story. That's what we've been asking for. We've been saying, can somebody tell us the rest of the story? John said, 
well, okay, I'll write, I'll write a, another account about Jesus, and I'm writing it for you guys, probably the Greeks and the Romans, right? And then you hear this. Nicodemus makes the logical argument, and then I think what David said is right on. They all know about Nicodemus. He could be dead. He could be alive. Well, the big thing about him was he was a defender of Christ and was probably really prevalent after Christ's death and resurrection. That's my opinion. So when they hear it, they go, ha, 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 right? How many rulers of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees have come to know, did any of the rulers of the Pharisees and Sadducees, were they convinced of Jesus? Unstated tell us. Yes, sir. You told us before that a lot of the freaks became Christians. What about the rabbis? Luke tells us, Luke says that at the beginning, is it the beginning of Luke or the beginning of Acts? I can't remember because I taught both. But um, I didn't teach Luke in detail, but I taught Acts in detail. And I think it's in Acts. And it says, um, first of all, Luke, I got it, I may not have it right, but Theodolus, lover of God in Greek, that was the name of the high priest during the time of Luke, would have been written, writing Luke. That book is written to him who was a priest. And I think in Acts, I believe it's Acts, says specifically, many priests came to know Christ or, or were, you know, convinced of Christ. Yes. So what about the Pharisees? What about the rabbis? I think lots of the rabbis, especially after the resurrection of Christ, a huge number of the rabbis came to be convinced about Jesus. You know, they get a bad they get a bad story, right? They get a bad shift because the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the bad guys. You got a bad guy in the story, and we never hear the the rest of the story, so to speak. You know, where's Paul Harvey? We need Paul Harvey. The rest of the story, but the rest of the story, I think, is these people could not have experienced this and not been great. But, example. What happened to Paul? Who to Paul? Saul? Right? Remember what happened to him? Okay, so he's one of those not convinced. He saw Jesus die on the cross. He saw he had to, right? He had to be there. He was the um, um, disciple. He was the learner, the Messiah of uh, the Rabboni of Rabbonis, the Rabbi of Rabbis. He was one of four of the Rabbis, you know, Pharisees that were part of the Sanhedrin. Okay, let's let's think about this. <coughs> there were four Rabbis on the Sanhedrin. One of them was kind of ish defending the disciples. Remember, he said, "It what was his name?" Um, Rabboni of Rabbonis. Uh, what's that? Gamaliel. Gamaliel told them in the Luke, in Luke, right? If it's a, if it's God, then it'll succeed. If it's not from God, it won't succeed. I'm not sure where he ended up at the end, but his disciple was Paul, was Saul. And Paul was converted on the road to Emmaus, or road to Damascus, road to Damascus, right? And there's four. So what can you gather from this? One out of four, so one quarter of the Pharisees, rabbis, logically were convinced of Christ. Okay? Yeah, of course, it's kind of forced con con conviction, whatever. But still, you know, if you're trying to infer you know, data, you know, that's the best I got. We do know, we do know that many of the priests came, and the priests are not, um, we talked about this before, right? The priests are not into the Torah, they, they're not into the books, into the Torah, the Tanakh, the Talmud, the Mishnah. The guys who are are the rabbis. The rabbis are the teachers. And so who would you, who would you logically and reasonably expect to be convinced of Christ. 
the rabbis. But yet we get a record that says the priest came to be convinced. Okay, you see where this is going? You know, I'm just saying, I, that it was a fertile field. It was a very fertile field. And, you know, there's more we can talk about as we get there. But anyway, so Nicodemus is the guy. And like I said, the whole crowd is like, yeah, Nicodemus. Yes, sir. After the resurrection, the, the, the Sanhedrin uh, bribed the guard, the Roman guard, to say that the disciples had come and stolen the body. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'll, we'll take care of you. Don't worry. So that was, that was their first reaction after the resurrection. But then, if if they were convinced otherwise that that he was not the Christ, wouldn't there have been further efforts to dissuade people from converting to Christianity? They did, and and we know they did. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned it before. Talmudic sources tell us that you know a lot of the Talmudic sources come out uh, years later. Of course, the Talmud was not written down until about 100 AD. So yes, you'd expect maybe 100 years later to see it represented in the writing. But, you know, they made up the name of the supposed uh, legionnaire that raped Mary. So in the Talmud, there's a record of, I think it's Basaris, they call him Basaris or something like that, uh, that legionnaire Basaris raped Mary, and that's why Mary had Jesus. But that's 100 years later. Yeah, but you see, the point is, okay, to us, so a story comes out, it's on the internet, right? It's immediate-ish. In the ancient times, a story comes out, and you get a, rec a recording of it years later. It's, a it's amazing. See, this is the problem with a lot of our professors and professorettes, supposedly in history. They seem to be idiots in some ways. Because, you know, in the ancient world, you expect, you know, the, the records about Buddha, the earliest records of Buddha are 100 years later, not written by anybody who knew Buddha. The records of things tend to lapse by 100 years or so. 100 years seems to be, or more, or more. But usually it's about 100 years. It, you know, when you find something mentioned, you'll find a recording of it 100 years later. Uh, either somebody finally got around to writing it, or maybe they just, you know, it took that long to get it down on paper. It's astounding that we have a record from 30 AD, about 30 AD, within the lifetime of the people who saw it. That should make you go, ha! Huh? Right? Because we do have a few autobiographical sources, you know, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Epicurus, the Epicurean dude. Um, you get a few, but most of the writing is like Josephus. Josephus didn't write about anything he ever saw. He wrote about stuff that happened before him, that he got records, second, you know, secondary sources mostly about, you know, even tertiary sources. So, you know, primary source stuff in the ancient world, the minute you see it, you go, oh, Coolio, right? So 100 years to me in ancient documents is not a huge dealie. It, it just means it took a little while for it to siphon down. So obviously, what were they doing? Well, there are stories in the Talmud about Jesus being a miracle worker, right? For Bezizelbub, for, for, the, for the devil, for Satan. Well, they, they use Satan, you know. But like I said, it's 100 years late. So what that means is these stories were percolating and being developed way before then and eventually made its way into paper, made its way into the record. So, you know, but it, what's cool about it is they exist. What does it immediately tell you? What, what is a story about Mary being raped by a legionnaire and having Jesus? What does that tell you? Well, and it was common knowledge that yeah. he was. And he was well known. Well known, Mary, virgin it, birth. Yeah. that there's a question about virgin birth, right? They don't know. And so they also want to, uh, what do you call it, a dissuade, um, uh, what's it? defame. They want to defame Jesus. So therefore, the worst thing you could ever be is, you know, remember, well, if you read my book, Centurion, Abinadar was half Jewish, half Roman. 
He never got a good deal, but he was really great that he could speak the language because everybody loved him because of that, right? Everybody loves a guy that can translate for you. <clears throat> so, you know, the big deal is that they were trying to defame Jesus by making the worst curse possible. You know, you were born of a rape. Your, your mother was whatever. But it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus existed. He was, a, you know, no well-known that his mother's name was Mary, that he lived in the period they're talking about, you know, all these things. It's proof. So you think that the professors and professorettes, what would they be saying to their classes? It's proof. Between the lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you don't have to read very far between the lines, yeah. right? It's just stated, like, he existed, he was famous, he... Bingo, bingo, bongo. And then we go get to the primary source documents. Oh, Goodness, we could never show a child in college primary source documents about Jesus. They might be convinced, like Nicodemus. Oh, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? Anyway, did you have a... I was just thinking, in our modern times, we think how easy it is to write something down. And it was not easy to write something down back then. You had to go to a great effort to get something written down. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and you know what? Just think back to my father's day, and maybe your father's, or maybe the generation before, when my dad wanted to write a letter, did he, did he just jot it down? No, what did he do? What, what did anyone, what did everyone in every industry in the United States of America do when they wanted to write a letter? I'm not kidding. Wait, wait. This is this is a mystery. Oh, they get the secretary. I was going to say they tell they take it to the secretary, yeah. and then the secretary would pick it up. Exactly. We have missed a huge. You know, it's like staring us in the face. You did a, a person who had a responsible position in a company, even a dumb engineer at the lowest level, did not write his own letters. You got the expert letter writer, the secretary. There was secretarial pools. There were rooms bigger than this, this building full of secretaries with typewriters, and their job was to produce documentation and letters. You'd call out one of these people, usually a woman, because they were trained in writing. They were trained in letters. They were trained in typing. They had all the skills. They came into your office, and did they write it down in longhand? What did they write? Short. Shorthand. They wrote in speedball shorthand. They knew, and you would dictate, and they would, and then they would take the letter and go to their typewriter. Would they put your exact words down? Yeah, not necessarily. They would finesse it. Yeah. They would finesse it. They would take, and my mother could do this. My mother was trained as a secretary. She could write the most beautiful letters. She put all the right words in it, all the things that would make people happy, right? Because, well, if you want to make a person mad, you would tell the secretary, I want a really mean letter to this guy. And she was supposed to write a mean letter, right? But generally, you wanted to make people happy. So she'd say, I want to write a very, you know, good letter to our, you know, the, about something. And they would produce the letters. Well, what you said is right. In the ancient world, okay, who did you get? The Labraeus, trained to writing, brought all his materials and his typewriter. No, he didn't have a typewriter. He just <laughs> brought his stuff. And you would dictate, and he would write it down, and then he would go home and put it into the most perfect Greek he could, bring it back for your approval, three copies, they're off. So, yeah, and it's we're talking $20,000, $10,000 to $20,000 per letter, and a book slave, unless you supplied your own uh, recorder, tra translator, carrier, right? Or you carry it yourself. That's the way the world works. You have a comment? Or? It occurs to me, too, that there's a step through to the process to dissuading people. And, that, uh, and if we're looking at what the Pharisees did then and what you know the professors and professorettes are doing now, step one is misinform, lie about it, hide the truth, so on. But then for the people that are convinced, harassment, you know, they because they were going after them, flogging them, arresting them, all sorts of persecution. Metaphorically, the same thing today, canceled, you know, 
harass, kicked out of academic programs. Yeah, yeah, harass. Uh, unfortunately, what does harassment do? Actually, grows the church. It grows the church. Martyrdom grows the church. So we're living in Gomorrah. Guess yeah. what? You're going to see more and more pain and suffering because, by the way, the Soviets uh, purged the church in 1925, basically murdered and tortured and imprisoned millions of Russians in the church. Almost every pastor, every nun, every priest were imprisoned and tortured by the NKVD under Stalin's orders. It's their, their records say that for every martyr, they gained five new Christians. You saw the greatest burst of the Orthodox Church in Russia due to Stalin's purges. And Stalin realized that in 1941 and basically gave the church back some of their rights, let them out of prison, and in 1943 made the church an official part of the state because he was trying he state could, control. State yeah. control always does mm. things in. Yep, but at least he gave back, you know, the co convents, the churches, everything. But he had created a monster <laughs> that, that he later tried to control. It still didn't work because the Orthodox Church is really uh, has great strength in Russia, even today. We don't give any reports because nobody's reporting on church stuff anyway. But, so, does our law condemn, here's Nicodemus, Nicodemus to say this, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? All right, that's pretty nice, pretty straightforward. Here's the King James, does our law, does our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Okay, and here's the Greek. Qualified negation may, not at least, the law, the Torah, come on of us, it distinguishes. You know, there's not really a word for judgment the way that uh, we translate it. The man face, man, in case that, a, again, another qualified negation, it is heard first from of him, and he comes to know what he makes or does. So here's the translation. Our law, Torah, does not distinguish the man if it is not firstly heard from him, and he comes to know what he has done. Very different than the statements in our translators. In other words, um, first of all, you have to hear from him. In other words, you you must confront him and must tell and must. Ask him, what is your side of the story? Remember, what's required under Jewish law? You have to have how many witnesses? Two, two or three, right? At least two. Two witnesses that agree. They can't, they can't, can't, can't be two disagreeing witnesses. In our law, you need one witness who doesn't even remember what happened 20 years ago, but yeah. they make it up. It's really cool. You can prosecute people and take money from them and, and property. Hmm. I think God would be really upset with that. You have to have other things that have lots of witnesses. We can just toss them out. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that funny? Lots of witnesses. Not not even the paper does even mention it. Mm -hmm. Amazing how that happens. Amazing how that happens. So you have to first hear his side of the story. Firstly, heard from him. That's what the law says. And second, he comes to know what he has done. In other words. What do you do? We do the same. We're supposed to do the same thing in American law. He he must be confronted by his accusers, right? And the accusers state what he did that is wrong. That's the way it works. So in our country, you know, you have to be, you know, you, you can't just have uh, in the Stalin and Nazi eras, right? All the communist socialists. This way it all works with international socialists and, and national socialists. So. It's, do you have to be confronted by the witness? No. It's just like Child Protective Services, right? Yeah. An anonymous call to, yeah. oh, their children aren't going to the government control schools. I see them outside every day. That is illegal, by the way, under our Constitution. They have to confront you with a witness. That's by law. But they do that all the time. That's the Soviet method. That's the way it works in Nazi Germany. That's the way it works in the Soviet. So, okay, hate to get into modern political subjects, but 
You notice that they are not giving the reasons for the prosecution of Mr. Trump by that Brad guy, right? He won't even tell them what's, what is the thing. Now, whether you like it or not, I got a real problem with them messing with our law and not confronting people appropriately because this, okay, this is God's law, right? And this is the way it's supposed to be. So whatever you think, if you want to have a legal system that's free and fair, you got to prosecute the bad guys and you got to hear from them and you got to let them know what they're done. And also you got to have two or three witnesses. But that's what God's law says. So be cautious. Anyway, they replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Okay. They answered him, they answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. And this is a Pharisee speaking to Nicodemus. They concluded for themselves, and they said to him, This is a qualified negation, and you, from out or among of the Galileans, you are. If you search diligently and you look, that are because from out among the Galileans, a foreteller, no or not, stands up in the marketplace. I love this word. We've seen this word before. This is the word, egerii eknekros, right? To stand up in the marketplace from death. It's a word that's used because there is no word for resurrection. This word's used. There's uh, this word and another one, egeria. They're very similar words, but this this is that word. So there's the the writer is giving us a foretelling with the use of language, and it's beautiful. It's really a good writer. They can clear for themselves, they said to him, and you are not out of among the Gal from the Galilee. You search diligently and you look at that from among the Galilee, a foreteller stands not up in the marketplace. Um, so, this tells you something. Number one, what do the Pharisees acknowledge that Jesus is? Yeah, he's a foreteller. So they're saying he's not because they think, they, they don't remember or don't know that he was born in Bethlehem. So they're saying he's from Galilee, so therefore he's not one. No, no, they're saying, what are the people saying? He is the... Christ, and the Christ is the one who's the son of David who comes from Bethlehem. But by saying that a foreteller doesn't come out of Galilee, they're saying that the implication is that he is a foreteller, but he can't be the Christ. You see this? It's, it's a really interesting. And yeah, this is this complicated? This is a little bit complicated, but it's really cool because what they're telling you, like I said, is they they are from their own words saying, look, a foreteller doesn't come out of Galilee. So therefore, he's got to be a foreteller. So I, very interesting, right? In other words, okay, whether they're saying he's a, directly a foreteller or not, what are they saying? He is looking like to them to be a prophet, right? He's convinced the people. The people are split. Is he the Christ? Is he the foreteller? Who is he? You know, so they're not talking about Elijah anymore, right? It's it's kind of interesting. There's there's a lot going on here, and I think, you know, I told you before in English, we see a lot of this euphemistically. The Greeks see it as a concrete statements, as statements that are concrete that, that are implied telos. In other words, that they're not telling you the answer. You, you literally have to look between the lines and see. You know, just like the Nicodemus thing. Are any of the, are any of the rulers, have any of the rulers believed in Jesus or trusted in Jesus, convinced through Jesus? And they bring up Nicodemus, <laughs> Nicodemus right? And then can, a, can the Christ come from Galilee? Well, no, he's not from Galilee, actually. 
Yeah, they're, yeah. They're actually proving, I mean, they're shooting themselves in the foot and they don't know it. Well, the other one, too, is, and we'll see it, and I've got it in the notes because it hits it right away. They say, well, he's got a demon, right? Who do you think is trying to kill you? The demon has convinced you that someone is trying to kill you. And what does it say at the very beginning? The Pharisees were trying to kill him. Which implies that who has a demon? The Pharisees. <laughs> these, are, these are wonderful comedic relief. If you don't want to call them jokes, that's okay. They're unstated tellos. They're comedic relief that the, the readers of this, the hearers of this at the time, would just be like chuckling, right? We miss it, you know. Well, of course, you can't laugh at the Gospels. You can't laugh even if there's something funny, right? There is funny stuff all through John. John, We're going to see even more funny stuff. You know, John is full of, of these really, really neat things. Just like, just like it says this. Just like they use this word. He stands up in the marketplace, right? There are other words he could have chosen, the writer could have chosen. Now, it says that they said this. So the implication is he is quoting what they said, right? So somehow he knew what they were saying. He was listening. This is not closed door kind of thing, right? They're probably in the temple. They're hearing it. But what's really interesting is, the implication is they really said this. But you notice the word choice, right? If they said this, what are they doing? They're making a foretelling, right? They're making a foretelling what? Of the resurrection. Because that's the exact words used in the resurrection point. They could have, they could have used other words. We're going to see this over and over again. Now, whether and I think John is recording history, okay? I think this is recording history. That's what my second mission book was all about, was is it the record of history in the, in the Socratic dialogues, or is it just, you know, a made-up uh, dialogue, right? I think this is not made up. I think John is recording it exactly. But look at the words that are chosen, right? I think he actually recorded real words, but if you take the other standpoint, did John chose these words specifically, right? We call that beautiful writing. We call that classical literature. That's the way you write great literature. You give foretelling. And here's a point. We're going uh, gonna to have to remind you this every, for the next uh, at least one or two sessions. The earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have John uh, 7.53 through 8.11. A few manuscripts include these verses holding or in part after John 7.36 and John 21.25. Some of them are found in Luke 21.38 or Luke 24.53. You know what this section is up? The, the next section, we won't hit it right away, but the beginning of chapter 8 is the woman caught in adultery. And that is probably not. We will look at it. We'll go through it, and I'll show you how... It doesn't fit, but it is not found in in the ancient witnesses. It's found in later witnesses. We believe that it's a Gnostic ad, and when you see it, you're going to say, "How do we know it's a Gnostic ad?" Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Uh, when you look at the Hammurabi, is the Hammurabi text? No, what's the text? There's. Uh, oh man, I, I should remember this. There's there's the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then I think it's the Hammurabi text. I've got a copy of it. It's the ones, it's the documents from about the first century that are found. Whenever you find texts of the New Testament documents, the, the confirmed New Testament documents, the ones we have generally in our New Testament, you never find them mixed with Gnostic texts. What's Gnostic texts? The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas. Mary's, there's Mary's text, there's a lot of them. If you haven't read them, read them. They're really fun to read. They're really interesting. They do more to prove the fact of existence of Christ. But some documents are Gnostic. What's Gnostic? 
Where'd the end, I guess? Gnostic, okay. So I have animism, right? Animism is the first religion to start with animism. Animism is that spirits make things happen, like running water, burning wood, life, trees, plants, animals are, have a spirit in them. The spirit is what makes them work. That's what makes you work. You have a spirit in you. That's animism. Everything's filled with spirits. It's like um, uh, Shintoism in, in Japanese, in Japanese culture. You go, when you develop a writing, when you develop liter literacy, you go from animism to pantheonic paganism. Why? Because suddenly there are things you can't explain with animism that you can only explain when you have words. The word love cannot exist without a written word. It can't exist. Words for emotions can't exist. You know, what kind of words can I only have under non-literate societies? I can have action words, like verbs that I can see or, or express, and I can have nouns. The problem with the words, though, is can I have archetypes of things? Oh, man, I'm getting really complicated. It gets complicated. Archetypes of things. Can I have a chair as an archetype? without a written language? No. Look at all the different chairs in this room. If I say the word chair, what chair do I mean? Until I have a written language, a chair is a thing to sit on, right? And I might even describe it as a thing to sit on. And you might say it's a thing to sit on. But we found in, in tribes of people that come from non-literate cultures, if you say, um, let's say you say a bear, and they don't, they don't use a bear. There's no a bear. There are only the bear. The bear I saw in, sitting in my uncle's tent. You see this? Why can't an archetype of bears exist for a, for a non-literate culture? It's only what you can see and experience. When you have words, and you Think about this. If I say a word to you, like chair, what do you see in your head? Do you see a chairs, a chair, an archetype of chairs? No. I see a C-H-A-I-R. I, that's what I see in my brain. I don't see a chair because I'm literate. You're literate. When you think of love, you, you don't think, I don't know what you think of. You can't, there's nothing to think of, right? Which love? Pizza. Your rabbit, your pet, your kid, your dog, right? Which lot? You don't. You see L O V E. Maybe you see L U V if you're a Gen X, you know, or a heart. <laughs> well, heart that that would be a non-literate. That's why hieroglyphics are Rubik's. Rubik's. I said right. Rubik's. Like I heart New York. Rebus. Rebus. The Rebus. Not Rubik's. The Rebus. So. You know, hieroglyphics are rebus because they go from, they're going from proto-language to actual language. But this is really complicated stuff. How do I get to Gnosticism? Well, I have to go from pantheonic paganism to um, uh, Mysterion. Always. Every religion goes, and by the way, Christianity looks like a Mysterion. That's what really attracted the Greeks and the Romans to it. It looks like a Mysterion, but it's not a Mysterion. How do you know it's not a mysterion? Christ is risen. Christ has come. Christ is risen. Christ will come again, right? The mystery of faith is open. You don't have to be in it for 40 years and get all the handshakes and all the levels, you know, to reach the point where I tell you the secret of the mysterion. But mysterions always are done in secret and always have secret knowledge. And then you get to Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, and by the way, you go from pantheonic paganism to, to mysterion when you invent science or basically logic, reasoning. And you go from Gnostic to Gnosticism, Christianity caused Gnosticism. But Gnosticism, you really get there through a scientific awareness or an empirical awareness. What is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is the belief 
that you gain salvation through knowledge. Now, if it's knowledge about Christ, it might be a positive. But Gnosticism, Christ was a seeker who sought what kind of knowledge? Theological or godly knowledge, and then expressed it. What was Buddha? Buddha was a seeker who expressed and found transcendental whatever. He found, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, ninefold. the ninefold path. Well, what, what, a divine, what do they call it? Um, and, in, and in Hinduism and Buddhism, it's basically annihilation. You don't oh, exist. Right. Yeah, you, you, and you join the universe. You join the universe. Your, your consciousness gets sucked. Oh, this is a wonderful end, right? Um, I know. It's just not attractive to me at all. Like, it, that's not what I would want. <laughs> right. Or, nor, nor reincarnation, because although it does give you another chance, I guess, like, you have to go through this world so many times, and you have to do the pain and suffering and everything over and over. Like, I want to go to heaven. <laughs> I don't want to live it again. The fast, the fast pass. Well, you know that's that's the whole thing with Greeks. You know, as the Greeks went from animism to pantheonic paganism, you see there it reflected their myth, their myth structure. So they started with with animism, and you know, where with pantheonic paganism, where'd you go? To Hades. Everybody went to Hades. But then some people went to the Elysian Fields. And if you didn't quite make it to the Elysian Fields, if you wait, waited a, hundred, a thousand years later on, then you might make it to the Elysian Fields. And then as they got, you know, introduced to Hindu, they began a reincarnation thing. So even if you went to the Elysian Fields, you would be reincarnated. You know, you went through levels of hell, Hades, until you, you went to Elysian Fields, and then you got reincarnated and got a, a second chance. At, at what? Yeah. Going back? Oh, yeah, you know, this doesn't sound happy. And then you can have annihilation if you have nirvana, right? Oh, what a yeah, wonderful. Yes, sir. So, uh, Judaism, Hebrew Judaism, Hebrew Judaism, Hebrew Judaism, Hebrew Judaism didn't go through any of it. Ah, they did, though. You look in the Old Testament, they started with animism. And, you know, when we have the written, the written word, or, the you know, the written documents we have, really are Moses writing about the previous stuff that happened with um, Abraham. And Abraham came from a culture that was where they had a moon goddess. And it says that God called him out, right? The God called him out of the worship of that, of his thing. So they had pantheonic paganism, which means they had, they were literate to some degree, right? And that he said, you are my God, or I am your God, right? And so we see the animism, we see pantheonic paganism, and then we see what? God, Jehovah, calling them out into to him, right? So the implication is there are other gods. And the thing about Judaism is Judaism looks like what? Mysterion. Yeah, it has a mikvah. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, there's even more. You know, this is, of course, you know, I don't intend to waste any time or go down rabbit holes, but, you know, that this is really important stuff because in my book, Egypt, I talk about this. You know, the thing is that when the Hebrews left Egypt, now depending on which professors and professorettes and historians you talk to, it looks like Atomkamen was enacted by the next pharaoh. What was Atomkamen? The, the one god, right? God. The one god. In other words, the society was so shocked by Jehovah, the Jehovah God, and the destruction of all their gods and deities, you know, by Jehovah God, that the next generation, the pharaoh said, uh -uh, we're going to do the same thing, right? And so the Atom Common was like God, was like the Jehovah God. And so it, it changed. And then I think it went two generations, three generations, and then all of a sudden, bam, they were back to the, the old way, right? So it didn't stick very long. But just the fact that it stuck, what, maybe 80 years, 100, 100 years, give it a 100-year thing, two gens, right? 
that they had that, and we see it reflected in their culture enormously. So they start what we know, everybody starts with animism, the problem we don't have much written down because you're not literate with animism. But if you look at Japanese culture, you'll see what animism really looks like in, in Shintoism. Then you move to pantheon of paganism with literacy. Judaism looks like a mysterion. It's not quite a mysterion, but it looks like a mysterion. You notice? Mysterions always have a singular god, a top god, right? They're named after either their founder or their god. Christians were first called Christians in Antioch by the Greeks because Christianity looked like a mysterion. I'm not, I guess, arguing that they didn't use mysteria. They didn't use mysteria. I just don't think they evolved through mysteria. I think they saw the mysteria as a good way of getting out and taking advantage of something that was already put in place. Oh, you mean the you mean the, uh, the Christians? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I agree 100. percent You're right on. Is okay. Here's the answer to the question: Is Christianity a mysterion? No, it's not. Is Judaism a Syrian? No, it's not. That's what's so cool about it, right? The Coolio thing is that here you have every religion, all religion, religious structure in human cultures, following that thing. Animism, pantheonic paganism, Mysterion, and Gnosticism. Christianity and Judaism did not. They didn't. How did they get started? The people were called out. The in in the time, you know Abraham, Abraham was called out by God. The and I don't disagree. I agree one hundred percent. The problem you got with Noah is I don't have any primary sources. So it's you know we've talked about this before. We talk about Torah. You know, is it collective memory? Is it revelation? I go with Revelation because collective memory gets really stinky and dangerous from a, a standpoint. So it's probably best to argue that it's Revelation from God. You know, and of course, Revelation from God is going to be truth, right? It may not be the truth that you imagine unless you're reading the Hebrew. That's why I let, you know, that's why I'm always worried about language. Look to see what the language says or doesn't say, right? Because Hebrew is really euphemistic. So you got to be careful with Hebrew. Greek, on the other hand, is very concrete. So you could be less careful about Greek. Greek should say exactly what it means. English, completely euphemistic. Just think of love, and you'll think of the word, L-O-V-E, if you can spell, right? If you're just texting, you might have a little problem with that. But anyway, you, maybe you use a heart. You know, they go back to hieroglyphics almost. But, well, we are regressing as a society. Yeah, we're regressing. <laughs> but see, you're right. It looks like, and I'm I'm 100 agreement with you. Paul, look, God is the author of this, right? God is the guy who set up the way human cultures think about religion. Tertullian wrote that, right? God, in His infinite mercy and infinite knowledge said, hey, those Greeks have this thing, this Mysterion thing. And you know what? Judaism looks a little bit like Mysterion. And you know what? Christianity, if I make it look a little bit like Mysterion, they'll come to the first meeting. <laughs> right? Right? That's the whole point. If, if you come and you're convinced, then you're there. That's the whole point of, by the way, the... Um, uh, I love the coffee gospel thing. I, I thought we would do that with our uh, uh, 1037 service, but coffee gospel places, the whole point of a coffee gospel house or a, a, co a coffee gospel church is it doesn't look like a church. You bring the people in, you have a church service with coffee and tea, and you present them the gospel, and what do they do? Well, it can be like the three in Athens. I want to hear more. I agree. I don't want to hear anything more about it, right? But the point is you bring them in and you, you at least get to uh, show them the gospel, right? And so I think God is so smart. God is like, <laughs> you know, hey, 
You know, this looks like a mysterion, so we're going to have special signs. <gasps> Hebrews are supposed to have signs. We'll have the fish sign. Well, and the cross sign eventually about 300 AD, right? We'll have, yeah, we'll, we'll have all these beautiful things, right? Baptism. Baptism. You, the clothing. You, you know, we don't do it. We don't do it. I'm sad. We used to kind of do it, even in Lutheran culture. What did you always take a baby in to get baptized? What? A white baptismal robe, right? Back, okay, Orthodox Church, here's what Orthodox Church is. Here's what we believe early Christians did. No matter whether, well, you can only be baptized if you were an adult. They didn't baptize infants in the early church. So when they baptized you, you were naked. So you took off your robes. You went into the water. No one touched you. You were baptized. Okay, they, they went through. If you look at the Orthodox Church, they're probably really close to what they ended up doing. And then you came out of the water, you were naked before everybody, and they clothed you. They may have done it in such a way that it was, you know, really tasteful, right? That, you know, the, the priest stands, you know, with the robe and, you know, puts it around you so that, you know, you're not displaying all your wealth to everybody, you know. Just say it. But, you know, the thing is that that, the robing, the naming, they gave you a new name. They gave you your name. When you were baptized, I could go through the whole thing. I, I've talked about Mysterion before. Um, probably shouldn't, but I've already used the time up. But anyway, the most important thing to recognize is that we, we're we going to get into a, a place where we're going to talk about some Gnostic kind of stuff. And the reason is because the next verses are not in, they're not in the early documents. They're not, they should not be included. If you look at the bottom of your text, Mary, this is what um, the King J or the NIV says in most of your NIV Bibles. Many of the NIV Bibles will tell you that this is not included in the ancient sources. We don't know where it should be. In fact, it shouldn't be. It's kind of like when we talk about Mark. You remember Mark? Mm -hmm. The end of Mark has uh, an ad that is obviously an ad. And we're going to look at language, the Greek language and see the differences that we've seen. And I think you'll see as we look through it in the Greek, you'll go, huh? How could this not be an ad? But we'll see. Anyway, we're out of time. And next week, what we'll do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. I gave you part of the synopsis or the outlook for, for the thing. We'll finish the very last verse, which isn't very much. It's a short thing. And then we'll get into the, um, the outline of the seventh chapter and I think it'll help you see with your see how John again see how John is making this logos to tell us thank you father for this day and thank you for your word in your name we pray